Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the El Dorado Neighborhood Library. This library was opened in 1970, uh, and I mention that because today is April 14th, which is the last day of National Library Week for 2018. Uh, and this library, I, I'm extremely honored to be here at the El Dorado Library because this was my library growing up. Uh, I wanted to start today, uh, today's presentation about my book um, by talking a little bit about the library and the role that this place and particularly this very room played in the writing of Persistence of Vision. Uh, it kind of starts even before this library opened. Uh, we used to be served by uh, something known as the bookmobile. Some of you may recall that they had a bus that uh, would drive out, park, and you could do your transactions, checking books out, checking books in on the bookmobile. So. Uh, there was a, a librarian that drove the bookmobile, uh, Marie Reedy. And honestly, at the time, I, I didn't know her first name was Marie. In fact, I didn't know she had a first name. Sort of like teachers, you know, you always call them Mr. or Miss, and you never really think about the fact that they're people. Uh, but Miss Reedy was super nice. She was very, very nice. And El Dorado Neighborhood Library opened, and she became the children's librarian. She'd already been coming to our school doing presentations for the students. Uh, she'd come in costume and, and read to us, um, talk about different books. And when El Dorado Park Neighborhood Library opened, uh, she became the children's librarian here, and I became one of her, one of her kids. Um, I would come uh, on Wednesdays during the summer, the year that this place opened, into this room and Marie Reedy would put reels of 16 millimeter film on a projector and I would sit here by myself. Irony. <laughs> uh, and I would watch silent horror movies. These were films with uh, like John Barrymore and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Lon Chaney in The Phantom of the Opera, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, there was a, a film called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which uh, was really very weird. And to my young brain, I'm pretty sure I didn't even understand what, what I was watching. Uh, but all of these things kind of became important to me. And I, I was very interested in film and filmmaking. In fact, I'd have to say, by the time I got to junior high school, I was pretty well versed in film history. Uh, because I'd begun to explore other aspects of it, like the comedies, Charlie Chaplin, the, and Laurel and Hardy. Um, I was a huge Laurel and Hardy fan. Um, and that kind of dovetails into uh, this other aspect of the things that inspired me uh, to do this, uh, which has to do with my family history in the city of Long Beach. Um, the book, Persistence of Vision is a historical detective thriller that takes place in Southern California in 1929. And a large part of the action in the book takes place in Long Beach. Uh, part of that was because of my family history and, and the, that I had a lot of interest in the history of the city. Uh, and I knew a lot about it. Um, this particular episode in my family history is that my uncle Joe, when he was about, I don't know, 14, uh, he and his friend, uh, a guy named Harry Buffum, for those of you of a certain age, you may recall the Buffum's department store chain. That was, that was Harry's family. So Harry and my uncle Joe used to do close-up magic with coins and cards, and, uh, and they would go out in public and perform. And so they happened to be in Avalon on Catalina Island one day. And Stan Laurel, was there and saw them perform. And he was quite taken with these two young men and their abilities as magicians. So he invited them to come out to his yacht. And we have, I'm, and I've seen this ever since I was a little kid, this picture of my Uncle Joe and Harry Buffum standing on either side of Stan Laurel in his yachting outfit <laughs> on his yacht. And you know, you always think about Stan Laurel in his outfit from the comedies with Oliver Hardy. When I, s I see this picture of him in, in his yachting cap with his blazer and his slacks, and you know, it's a completely different look. And I kind of 
kind of stored that away in memory. Because when uh, I, I wrote my book, and he makes his entrance, because he's a character in my book, he's dressed in those yachting clothes. Uh, so that, that, was, uh, that was part of it. So the family history really, um, with Long Beach, is my grandfather was a developer here. And he was involved in real estate development. He built a 12-story skyscraper at the time in 1923. It was the tallest building on the West Coast. And that stands today at the corner of uh, what was American Avenue, is now Long Beach Boulevard, and East Broadway. Uh, that building survived the 1933 earthquake, which is kind of amazing because it's masonry. <laughs> it's all brick. Uh, he also was responsible for developing uh, the area known as Bixby Knolls. Basically, that's where my father grew up. They had a, uh, a spec house that they built in the middle of what was a bean field, or many bean fields. And so if you're familiar with the, the television show Arrested Development, uh, that house that was in the middle of nowhere, yes, my father was George Michael Bluth. He grew up in that spec house surrounded by a bean field. So a lot of family history in the city, and I had a profound love for Long Beach. And so I wanted to um, personally experience things that I had not been able to. Uh, my family went to the Pacific Coast Club. Uh, I never got to go there. It was closed before I came on the scene. Uh, a lot of old buildings, the Jurgens Trust building, which was torn down and uh, very sadly to this day is an empty lot. I, I, that just drives me crazy that there's this tendency to tear things down, you know? Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful building, too. So lots to do with the family history in Long Beach. And I also loved movies, and, and so that became part of it as well. Um, when I started writing the book, I really had thought about writing it as a screenplay, because that's what I did. I, I, was, um, I, uh, I was a filmmaker in addition to being a writer. Um, I'd never written a novel before, uh, thought I couldn't write a novel. It seemed too, too complicated. I loved reading mysteries and detective thrillers, and, and uh, oh, I read everything P.D. James wrote. Um, and, you know, you read those books, and I, I was thinking, how, how do they do it? How do they keep track? They've got all these characters. They've got all these plot threads. How could I possibly keep all that stuff straight? And so as I thought about writing a screenplay, I, I started thinking you know, maybe this isn't a screenplay at all. Maybe this is a book. So I shifted into uh, the idea of writing it as a narrative instead of as a screenplay. Screenplays are, are it's, to me, a screenplay is like a technical document. Uh, you create something that is, a, it's a set of instructions to give to somebody so that they can make this movie. So it's like, you know, I'm very slightly, uh, uh, different than the instructions you get it, it, when you open that, that couch you got at Ikea that uh, you have to put together with the little wrench, right? This is how you build it. So the script is like how you make a movie. Uh, writing a novel is a different story. You're responsible for everything. You're, you know, 100%. It's narrative. So uh, you're, you're filling in all the blanks. Uh, at any rate, when I started the project, back to the library, uh, at the time, the main library was in downtown Long Beach, it still is. Uh, they had a room with microfilm and microfiche that had all of the newspapers um, recorded, uh, Los Angeles Times, New York Times, and so on. And I, uh, I spent a lot of time in that library looking through every issue of the Los Angeles Times uh, for the period 1929. I had a vague idea of when I wanted the book to take place. but. It was the research that really locked it for me. Um, I had this idea that I wanted it to take place uh, before the crash, which happened, I believe, in October of 29. Um, and the reason for that is really more, uh, I did a lot of this on my gut. The, a lot of this book was written based on instinct. And part of it was, I had this sense, of, if you think about noir, um, that dark thing, and to me, the crash coming in October, which was months away, kind of kept the book from becoming a big happy, you know? No matter what happened in the book, there was still this 
um, for lack of a better term, event horizon that was out there in the future that things were going to go south. So that was part of it. So I spent a year making regular trips to the library and, and spending hours going through those newspapers and making notes. And I had file folders, notepads filled with references and dates. And I was not only reading the articles, but one of the things, and, and if anybody else here is interested in doing research, I, I got to tell you, one of the best things to look at in these old publications are the advertisements because the advertisements will tell you things about the culture and the society that you won't get reading the articles. And in fact, I found this advertisement that was so astonishing to me when I read it. Today, it would, you, you wouldn't see that ad because it wouldn't mean anything. But at the time, it was so amazing to me that they were advertising this that that became actually a very significant part of the book. So uh, w w we took all of this research, took me a year, and then I thought, okay, well, I kind of need to start writing. Um, I, I liken this process to something my friend Joan describes as, uh, it's a recipe she uses called back burner soup. Uh, you put everything in the pot, put it on low heat, back burner, let it sit. It just evaporates, boils down, concentrates and you get that flavor, you know. So that's kind of how I approach writing this book, like uh, back burner soup. Uh, it became as much a process of reduction as it did of explanation and narr narrative. Um, there was so much material that I, I had to just start taking it out. Um, there were aspects of the book that I wrote in the first drafts that I realized, okay, I don't need all this. I've got, I've got way too much. So it just started, you know, pulling it out. But um, when I started writing the book, it happened to be uh, Memorial Day weekend, and um, it took me a long time to write it, by the way. So, uh, we're talking Memorial Day weekend 25 years ago. So some of you are, oh, we weren't even born at the time I, I started writing this book. Um, in fact, I joked that my friends had children and sent them off to college in the same amount of time. Uh, anyway, went out to um, Palm desert with some friends for Memorial Day weekend and I took my laptop with me, took my notes and Saturday morning got up, went out by the pool with a cup of coffee and fired up the laptop and I started writing. Now because I hadn't outlined this, I had no idea of what was coming. I really was sitting there thinking, what would I like to be reading right now? And so I started writing and I wrote all morning sitting in the shade by the pool in this at this house and and I got to tell you the house is in the book too because this house was kind of amazing the, the whole place were, were the, the, there was a community a, you know a kind of a uh, gated private community but there were no walls uh, you had houses that were separated by wide expanses of grass and hedges uh, and each one had its own pool you never saw the neighbors nobody interacted it was all just you go into this place and you hang out at your own house so I was there with these people, started writing, and I wrote all morning, and at the end of the morning, the end of the first chapter, my main character was dead. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> now what do I do? Well, tomorrow morning, you're going to get up, you're going to get your coffee and your laptop, and you're going to go back out there by the pool, and you're going to sit down, and you're going to start writing chapter two. And so I did. And as I started writing chapter two, this character came out of nowhere, driving in. in a, a, I, I had no idea who he was. But he introduced himself to me through my writing of him. Uh, in fact, later I went back and rewrote that first chapter because I had read something that, uh, again, I'm learning how to write a novel while I'm writing this novel. So uh, don't start the story at the beginning, they say, start the story in the middle. And so I went back to my first chapter and I, I kind of cut off the first half of the first chapter. So I literally started in the middle of a scene. And I'm pretty proud of the way that that ended up working because I'm that, that <laughs> I, the first line of the book, I think, is a really powerful sentence. It's, I, it's a paragraph by itself. And I wanted it to be that because of the sentences. Kind of like uh, you read it and you go, what? Just, uh, you know, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, 
so that was, that was how it started, that weekend. And so <laughs> Memorial Day, okay, the book starts on Memorial Day, which it was pointed out to me by my editor, was not actually a national holiday at, in 1929, but it was a holiday in California. So Memorial Day, whew, safe. Um, the house is in it, although it's not quite the same house. Uh, another aspect of this, I, I, I'm interested in architecture and I had seen a show, uh, I think it was on 60 Minutes years ago with the architect Philip, um, oh goodness, what the heck is his name? I can't remember, Philip something. And he was uh, building a home out of concrete where they, were, they had forms and they were pouring the concrete in and the entire home was made out of concrete, molded concrete. And I thought about this and I thought, oh, that's cool. I mean, you know, in the desert, it gets really hot. So concrete might work the way adobe worked, you know, to keep the heat out. So I thought, oh, let's, let's take this house and it's made out of concrete. Only Philip, what's his name? I wish I could remember his name. Um, he was a contemporary architect and I needed to find somebody who would be his, his correspondent in 1929. And I came up with this name, uh, Le Corbe. I didn't really know very much about Le Corbe. And in fact, again, strangely, intuitively, found out later after I said, yeah, he, he designed this house, that that's really what he did. He worked with concrete. He built structures with concrete and uh, in a they called it uh, the brutalist school uh, of architecture. So that was kind of interesting. Um, then we had uh, uh, the decoration in the home. Um, I was interested also in design and there is a guy, um, Erte, which he's a quite a popular and famous uh, designer. Uh, didn't really know very much about him other than some general ideas about the work that he had done. And so I said that he had designed the inside of the house and that neither Erte or Le Corbe was really crazy about the fact that, uh, hi, welcome, um, were crazy about the fact that they, they were kind of being forced to cohabit in this house. Uh, so uh, Erte actually, and again, strangely, uh, I had managed to come up with this connection. Erte worked at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Productions in Culver City, which is another aspect of the book. Some of it takes place there. Uh, as a designer in 1929. So he had not really established himself as, a, as a, an artist, but he had been producing art. And in fact, uh, the way that he, his art came to be in that home was that the guy that built the house was involved with MGM and would have had possibly contact with Erte. So I kind of accidentally came up with that connection. So that was, that was actually kind of cool. So that weekend, um, I, I wrote two chapters, I think, and then over the next year, I wrote the rest of the book um, in its initial draft and started rewriting. And I did like three, three drafts. And at that point, thought, all right, I'm going to put it away. I don't, know, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I need to figure out how this book is going to go. But it, I had actually gotten the entire story mapped out, beginning and end. So I put it away uh, for a few years and then decided, all right, I want to I go back to it. Well, technology had evolved to the point where in order for me to go back to work on this book, I had to find a floppy drive because it was on floppy disks and floppy drives weren't being included in computers anymore. So I had to find one, and I did, and I was able to load the files and, and uh, printed out the book as it existed, and I started working on it again. And I did three more drafts, and at that point, I thought, all right, I think it's time for me to show this to somebody. So I had a select group. I, I'd been reading about, you know, how do you do this? How do you, how do you create, uh, or how do you, how do you have people review what you're doing, you know, and give you notes? And so part of it is find people who are supportive of you. And so I did. I actually had a couple of friends. Um, and then she's also a friend, but she happens to have been my ninth grade English teacher, who I maintained friendship with for all of these years. And Suzanne read the book. I have to admit, at the time, I thought, yeah, okay, six drafts, yay. But in retrospect, I think, I can't believe I let people read that. Well, Suzanne gave me some really good notes. And one of the things that she told me was, um, 
you know, I'd written short stories, written screenplays, but when you write a novel, it's not like a long short story. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole different animal. So one of the things that she said to me that I really took to heart was that the more things you can connect in your story, the more points you can connect, the better. And I, I took that to heart. And as I started the seventh draft, I looked at what I had done and started realizing I have some of those points already in place. I just need to really connect them. So a couple of drafts were really just kind of tightening those connections up. Um, and it, again, it was some strange stuff. Uh, just as an aside, um, one of the aspects of this is uh, the main character has a broken tooth because of something that happens to him. And at that point, thanks to a friend of mine who bought me a, uh, a sandwich from a street vendor that had a rock in it, <laughs> I cracked a tooth. And having already written this on one level, now I'm having the experience of having a broken tooth and I'm able to add that layer to this story. Um, one of the other things that I did was uh, I, at the time, was doing video production and I got a business license in, uh, welcome. Uh, so I, I got a business license in Palm Springs and I went out there and springtime, great. Starts to get closer to summer, starts to get hotter. Well, I'd written the book already, you know, and it, oh, I wrote about how hot it was, but now that I'm actually there, experiencing the heat and seeing why people put towels on their steering wheels in the cars, because if you don't do that, you're going to basically get grill marks on the palms of your hands when you try and grab onto them. In fact, a, another aside, one night I was, uh, and again, this, this, I sort of like extrapolated this and put it in the book. Um, I was driving in Palm Springs one night and I, something happened. I was parked at a light waiting for the light to change and I heard this sound and I looked over at the ground next to my car and there was something, uh, a little disc shaped thing that was kind of rolling around like it had just dropped out of the sky. And I, I looked up, didn't see anything. And looked down, I thought, I don't know what that is. I made my left turn and I started driving on and realized as I looked in my left mirror, the little wide angle rear view mirror thing that had been glued to the mirror was gone. <laughs> it was so hot, it had melted the glue. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, we're talking serious, serious heat. Um, and also, it's, it's not just what the heat feels like, but what the heat does to your body. Um, it's, it's hard on your body. What it does to buildings, paint, cars, you know. So being there, I was able to add more layers of reality to it, polish. So this was another process. It took several years for me to, um, to add these new layers. And then I got to a point where I, I once again, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about what I'm doing. I think maybe the time is put it away again and, and just maybe work on some other things. And so at that point, um, I went back to working on screenplays. And I began uh, writing screenplays that I, 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 had, I had a habit, because, partly because of my journalism training. Um, when I started on this book, I don't think I'd ever done more than three drafts of a project. And I, I'd already gotten past seven drafts on the book, but then on the screenplays I worked on, I was doing 15 drafts. And I'm realizing this is, this is how you get it really good and tight, is just you know work on it and work on it. So eventually I went back to the book and um, about this point, I felt like I was getting, getting it to where I wanted it to be and realizing, okay, eventually it's going to be done. What am I going to do with it? And so I, I had a copy of a book called The Writer's Market. Um, in fact, I had three copies of it because like any writer, you know, you think, oh, yeah, yeah, I get a copy of The Writer's Market. So I had three copies of The Writer's Market from three different years. You know, I did have a current one. So I got it out and I started reading the chapter on how to get an agent because I thought, well, okay, maybe what I need to do is get an agent. And so I read the chapter, had good information in it, and then it had a directory of literary agents. And at this point I'm thinking, you know, the internet is really the thing to use for that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go look on the internet. Um, oh, and I wanted to just also say that all the research I talked about doing that, you know, in the library with the microfilm and the microfiche, there was no internet at that time. So I did not have that ability 
to go, you know, just surf and find stuff. Um, uh, Guillermo del Toro, the uh, author and filmmaker, talks about research uh, on his projects, and he talks about how people who are writing tend to rely on the internet. And he feels like if you're really, if you're doing all your research on the internet, you're not really doing research. So um, again, no internet at this point in time. What, uh, what am I going to do? So I, I started writing again, and the next day, so I, so I did, that, did the research with the Writer's Digest, right, or Writer's Guide. The next day, I happened to have been, um, as a video producer, I, I had partners, producing partners who had projects, and I would help them out. Next day, I, I was signed up for two days. We were going to go basically do shoots around Southern California. I had no idea what we were going to be doing. I just said I would help. Get in the van. Next morning, we drive to L.A., and they briefed me on the way. We're going to interview literary agents about what they're looking for, how they want you to approach them. And I was like, how did this happen? So it's kind of a, another weird coincidence of the way things sort of just dovetailed. And it's happened time and again through the whole process of, of doing this book. So at that point, you know, I'm... I'm flabbergasted. I'm driving around Southern California talking to these people, asking them questions, and literally wearing the headphones with the mic, it's coming in my ears directly from the mouths of the literary agents. It was crazy. So one of the things that was interesting is that they, they, this is early days on self-publishing. So, uh, you know, there had been this thing called Vanity Press for forever. Vanity Press was you could pay somebody to publish your book, you know, and then for more money they'll, they'll market it. And for more money, they'll market it really well, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so self-publishing had started. And, and now all of a sudden, you had the ability to sidestep them and actually put the book out yourself. And if you were willing to do the heavy lifting, market it yourself. And the literary agents were not really fond of this idea at the time because they were watching their livelihood go away. You know, I mean, not everybody has had a successful uh, self-published book. But there have been actually several amazingly popular self-published books. The uh, what was it uh, Twilight series? That that Twilight series actually started out as fan fiction. The woman that wrote those books was writing fan fiction for I think um, oh at uh, True Blood. So she got into vampires, you know. And actually, I think she's the one that spawned an entire genre of uh, uh, was it uh, horror romance. Right, where you're you're making romance, writing romances between werewolves and vampires, and so there's this whole literary subgenre now. Um, so it's it's been an interesting um, process. Uh, again, worked on it some more. I, I hired an artist to do the cover, uh, and I did that in advance of the book being completed because I wanted to be able to. I mean, the same thing. I had a website set up. I had a Facebook fan page. I started promoting it long before the book was even finished. But I wanted to say a couple of things about this book cover because, again, it's this weird kind of like the way things just happened. Um, I had this vague idea that I wanted it to be a collage. And I, I didn't really know why. Um, so I put an advertisement on Craigslist for a collage artist. And what I got back were a bunch of people looking for work. You know, I got links to their their um, their samples of their work, and it was all just you know basic computer graphics, no collages. And then I got this one guy, Sam Lubitsch, and he sent me the link to his website. And his website was amazing. The collages that he had done were just mind-boggling. It turns out Sam is part of a dynasty of collage artists. His father. Uh, who goes by the name of Lou Beach, which is a play on his last name, Lou Beach. Uh, he was one of the original graphic artists for Slash Magazine, the punk magazine. So he used to do collage for Slash Magazine. Well, so Sam grew up in that house, you know, with him. Um, his aunt, Basia, and his sister, Alpha, are also collage artists. So he and I met one day and started talking about the project. And I told him enough about the book that he was able to go away and start working on an idea. And the idea that he came up with is the cover that is on the book today. 
He came up with this. The only thing that's changed from his original design is the title. Because the title of the book went through um, a couple of changes. Uh, but when I saw this, I, just, I was so blown away. I thought, oh my God, that's the cover of my book? How lucky am I? I, I, I joke about it, you know, that they say, don't judge a book by its cover. Well, guess what? Please judge this book by its cover because I am so thrilled with the job that he did on it. And it's, it's the kind of thing where I've, I've had friends tell me that, that had the book at their homes that in two different cases, people have come to their houses, seen the book just laying there, picked it up, and taken it because they started reading it. I'm like, okay, that's what it's supposed to do. Yay. So... Then I started looking at it and realized, why collage? And in a strange way, if you think about it, collage is putting pieces together to make an overall picture. And if that's not a metaphor for detecting, investigating a crime, I can't think of what is. So in a way, we came up with a nice symbolic way of representing what's, what's in the book. Um, and the image that he came up with also is uh, interesting because it's, it's the, while part of the book takes place in Joshua Tree, it, the, the scene that he depicts on this cover is not actually in the book. However, it is the scene that starts the plot in motion, which is referred to in the book. So he really did an amazing thing creating this, and I'm very, very happy that um, I was able to find him and to, to get him to do this. So... Um, the titles, by the way, originally the book was called Red Blossoms, which was the Akatillo. If you're familiar with the desert plants, uh, Akatillo are, um, they have long branches, and after it rains, they blossom. And their blossoms are blood red. And they, they make uh, reference to the Akatillo as uh, representative of, uh, uh, what do they call it, the signs of the crucifixion? Um, yeah, stigmata, okay? So the blood on, on the hand, that's, it's, so it's stigmata. And I thought, okay, those flowers figure in the story. Uh, they help somebody identify a location where something took place. Um, but I also was thinking red blossoms in terms of like when uh, somebody gets shot and the blood seeping in the fabric, creating a bloom, if you will, of red. Uh, then... I, somebody suggested to me, and it's funny, ironic, I guess, in a way, because of what I ended up calling the book, but they suggested that Red Blossom sounded a little too flowery, pardon the expression, for a detective novel. And I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe they're right. Well, let me think about this a little bit. And so I came up with another name. I called the book Dead Soldiers, because one of the things that happens in this book is that a number of the characters are veterans of World War I, and they get killed. So I thought, dead soldiers, okay. And the main character who's going through uh, a crisis in his life, he has very, very serious uh, problems, one of which is alcohol. Dead soldiers is empty bottles. And he has a few. So uh, I kept that title going for a while. And, and then it occurred to me that dead soldiers, if I told people that was what the book was called, that might not be the best marketing tool. You know, it, it, can, it has a negative connotation to it. And I thought, all right, well, what else could I call it? Well, there's a thing in this book, and, and this, is, this is another, th one of the changes that I went through was the main character is unable to see motion pictures because of a head injury he received as a child. Now, I made this up. I, did, I just made this up. Uh, the title of the book now is Persistence of Vision, which describes the uh, way that your brain and your eyes are able to see motion pictures. Because it, if you're familiar with it, a motion picture is really just a series of still images that run through a projector at a set speed. Um, there's no real movement. There's no real movement at all. It's your brain and the lag that happens between your optic nerve and your brain processing this information that creates the illusion of motion. Well, this guy's unable to see that. So when he goes to, he, he can't even look at a screen in a movie theater because he gets a headache. Well, I, again, strangely, I talked to a guy once and was telling him about this. And I, I told him, yeah, my main character, he can't see movies because of a head injury. And he goes, oh yeah, my uncle had that. 
I said, he did? <laughs> he goes, yeah. He hit in the head. Couldn't see movies anymore. So I'm thinking, oh, I thought I made that up. <laughs> okay, that, that's pretty good. So Persistence of Vision becomes the title of the book. Now, there's this whole layer that I wrote. And I was really proud of it. I thought, this is cool. And there are the ways that it's woven into this story. Um, at one point, I thought, what if I took that out and made it just a genre novel? Because, you know, that's a little weird. So I actually did a draft of the book where I went through it and I removed every reference to his not being able to see movies. And when I was done, I just, I felt terrible. I, I, and I, I, once again, I put the book away because I didn't know what to do with it. And a couple of years went by in which I was just ruminating. What, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this? And finally one day, I was talking to a friend of mine who is an author. She's written 35 romance novels. <laughs> and she said something to me about um, what, what, what she believed was the, the, the most important thing in, in writing a book. And she said, what you need to do is find a thing that makes your book unique. And I thought about that. And it, it took no effort for me to realize that what she was telling me was I had cut out the part that made my book unique. So I spent an entire draft putting back all of the stuff about persistence of vision and his inability to see movies. Which, as I redid that, I realized, okay, this isn't just a part of the book. This is the book. And that's why I called it persistence of vision. Because I, I realized, this is it. This is the story. So persistence of vision may not be a good novel uh, title for a detective novel either, but um, I think the way it all worked out was pretty good. I'm, I'm very happy with it. Um, the book is not perfect, uh, but it's not the fault of anybody but myself. I had, uh, I had an editor. As I was wrapping up writing it, I realized, you know, again, somebody else needs to have eyes on this because, you know, I'd spent 25 years writing this. I'd done so many drafts where I'd added things and taken things out. Um, I got to the point where I was literally um, second-guessing myself, doing rewrites, where I would, I'd be reading what I'd written after a few, you know, a couple of years away, and I would get this idea as I was reading it, oh, you know what, while, while they're doing this, this should happen. And I would add that. And then as I would proceed a paragraph further, I'd find the last time I worked on the book, I'd already done that. So <laughs> I had to go back and take that out. Well, so basically, I had broken my own book in a few places. So I, I needed an editor, and I was, I was trying to figure out, you know, how do you do this? I'm, I know people that do it. I was talking to a friend of mine who I had gone to high school with, and she and I both ended up at UC Irvine. She graduated and became a librarian at UC Irvine. She also happened to have majored in grammar and rhetoric. And so this, to me, made her a triple threat. Um, she was able to go through the book. Uh, she'd never done this before. But she went through the book. She proofread it. So all my grammar mistakes were corrected, my spelling errors that spell check had not caught, or, you know, because it doesn't catch actual words used incorrectly. <laughs> um, but then I started getting these spreadsheets in the mail from her spreadsheets that listed all the characters and the relationships, spreadsheets that broke down the action in the book. And I was able to look at this and, th and realize, oh my god, this is, you know, she's basically distilling the 25 years of working on this book into a spreadsheet that I can look at as a reference. Amazing tools to have as you're, as you're tightening those, those last nuts and bolts before you, you put it out. And so uh, I, I owe Lisa Shoup a huge, huge thanks. Um, uh, she did this as a favor. And I, I will say she seemed to kind of like the book, which was really nice too, you know, the, being the first person to read the final draft to have somebody give you some positive feedback. That was great. So um, book was done, had to get it out, did it, it's out. And we, I, I, it was published in July. Uh, last year. We launched at Timeless Pints because 
hey, it's a brewery and the book takes place during Prohibition. So that made sense. Uh, I've been doing uh, author events, talking like, as I am here uh, to promote the book. Um, and it's been uh, a really exciting process. And I'm very happy uh, to be here today. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to read the first paragraph since I mentioned that a little while ago. Um, the first paragraph is really one sentence. The stars were covered in blood. And like I said, the, the way that this originally started was that he's driving his car, going to the crime scene. And then he gets to the crime scene. And he goes in, you know, and I realized what I was writing there was the opening to a screenplay. It's like the establishing shot. Well, start in the middle. So I did. And you kind of get this, what the hell is he talking about? The stars were covered in blood. And as it proceeds, you realize what he's talking about. And it's... It's, uh, I think, a fairly apt description. Um, so then, moving forward, we, we begin to uh, introduce the characters. And the main character, who is a, a detective in, he's, he works for the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. Um, he is, uh, a lot of this book, by the way, takes place in Long Beach, if I didn't mention that before. No, I know I did. So um, he's, um, he's gone to... Uh, um, Hal Roach Studios. Hal Roach Studios in Culver City was where they produced a lot of the Laurel and Hardy comedies. And he's talking to the guard at the shack. And the guard doesn't believe he's a cop. But he directs him in. The reason the motion picture business was based in Los Angeles was to keep the part of it that Thomas Edison didn't own as far away from Edison and his attorneys as possible. The old man had sent muscle after unlicensed producers for patent violations. The cases ended more often in hospitals in the occasional morgue than in court. Edison's enforcers had hunted down productions, destroyed equipment, and harassed the talent. The ones with the best survival instincts moved across the country to Southern California. The benefits were mostly great working weather and a continent between them and Edison. And it was just a few hours from the Mexican border should the patent attorneys get to feeling frisky. Not all of the moving picture studios ended up in Hollywood. MGM was in Culver City. And not far away, Hal Roach Studios was at the corner of Washington and National. Moretti parked the DeSoto on the street and put the box of film and the black bag under the driver's seat. He crossed to the gate at the studio entrance. From somewhere behind the buildings came the sounds of hammering, sawing, and yelling. A large man in a guard's uniform took up most of the space in a shack the size of a phone booth. He sat on a stool with a newspaper spread out across his lap. Moretti showed his shield. The guard barely looked up from his newspaper. Yeah, what's this about then? Detective Daniel Moretti, I'm with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. And? And what? The guard carefully placed his chubby finger on the paragraph he was reading and looked up. State your business or beat it. Moretti blinked. He opened his coat to return the badge folder to his inside pocket and let the guard see the colt. The guard put his hands on his belly and began to laugh. Oh, God, that's rich. He stamped his feet, and the newspaper fell to the floor. I'm here to see Axel Olsen. The guard laughed harder. Why didn't you say so? He slapped his knee and nodded toward the glass door just inside the gate. Oh, laddie, you've given me a fit. I thought I'd seen everything. He leaned down and picked up the paper. Not an easy thing for a big man to do in such a small space. Go talk to the girl in reception. He's around. She'll find him for you. The burly guard smiled broadly. His face was flushed as he straightened up. Now run along. So Moretti can't convince him he's a cop because he's the guard at a movie studio who has seen every, every possible way to try and get through the gate. All right. A couple of more pieces here and then we'll uh, call it a day. So he's now talking to this woman in reception. The doorknob rattled and began to turn. The blonde pulled the cigarette from her lips and flicked it across the counter into a tarnished and dented brass spittoon in the, in the corner. The butt hit the rim and bounced in a small shower of sparks. It disappeared inside with a wet hiss. A thin man of middle age squeezed into the small room. He wore a yachting cap, white trousers, and a navy blue double-breasted blazer. He had a slim, pale face and ears that stood out from his head like the handles on a loving cup. He looked like he'd wet himself. Hello? He spoke with an English accent. He removed his cap and a pair of dark glasses. Sorry I'm late. 
Moretti smiled at the blonde. Thanks for your help. She ran a hand over her blouse and skirt as if they needed straightening. What's going through her mind? And remember what I said, if there's anything I can do. There was one thing. She smiled sweetly as she nodded at the yachtsman. As long as you're going out to the location, would you mind taking Mr. Laurel with you? So that's, the, that's Stan Laurel appearing in his yachting outfit. Uh, I got one more piece I want to read here, and then um, we'll call it. Okay. Uh, the two-hour rule quickly made Palm Springs a popular home away from home for the Hollywood crowd. During production, contracts restricted travel to no more than two hours from the studio in case retakes were required to make a release date or for publicity appearances or any other whim of a studio mogul. Palm Springs was exactly two hours from L.A. if you drove fast enough. The sun performed its nightly disappearing act behind the Santa Rosas. The temperature started going down as the shadow of the mountains made its nightly sweep across the valley. He pulled the DeSoto into a shady parking space by the office at the Casa de Cody. He had his pick. They were all empty. He left the windows down and brought the boxes of film and negative with him into the office. Violet, the redhead he'd met at Barry Medavoy's party, was on the switchboard. She stopped whispering into the mouthpiece of her headset when she heard the little bell on the door tinkle. It took her a minute to work up a smile when she saw Moretti. There was a look in her eyes that reminded him of the one he'd gotten from Agnes at the studio. Well, hello, Detective. Moretti. Which room is Chaplin in? She put her hand over the mouthpiece and shrugged. Which room? She laughed. I told you, he's got the whole place. Any idea which room he's in now? She shrugged again. One of the lines buzzed and she looked down at the switchboard. She looked up at Moretti, surprised. That's him! She punched a plug into the board and said politely, front desk? How can I help you? She listened intently for a few moments. Yes, sir. She grabbed the plug and pulled it from the panel. She turned to Moretti dramatically. He wants a sandwich. Moretti laughed. Better get him one. Which room was that? Five. She stared at Moretti, forgetting all about her other call. What happened to your face? He'd gotten beaten up. He mouthed the word sandwich and pointed it at the switchboard. The little bell tinkled again as he pulled the door open. Room five was the room past the pool where he'd seen the flickering light through the curtains. He was about to knock when the door opened. He stepped back in surprise. Charles Chaplin was a slightly built man with dark wavy hair. He wore a bathing costume, a white handkerchief knotted at the corners on his head, and a pair of dark glasses with round lenses in tortoiseshell frames. The comedian hadn't shaved in several days. He removed the dark glasses and blinked at Moretti in surprise. His sad, dark eyes belonged on a puppy. The puppy eyes looked past Moretti at the near darkness. Then he looked at Moretti's face. He turned and called into the darkened room. It's for you! Moretti pulled his shield. I don't have your sandwich. He flipped it open and held it out. The puppy eyes took it in and looked up at Moretti. There was more blinking. Mr. Chaplin, I'm Detective Daniel Moretti of the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. Then Chaplin smiled and stepped back from the door. Yes, of course. I know exactly who you are. He spoke out of the sign of his mouth into the dark interior of the hotel room. Barrymore, I said it's for you. So that's just a couple of little glimpses into, into what's happening in this book. Um, uh, Chaplin, Barrymore, Stan Laurel, and then Lon Chaney, who, you know, I, I became very fascinated by Lon Chaney early on. And I, I want to mention also that the appearances of Charles Chaplin and Lon Chaney really are not just me expressing my fascination with them. There, there are connections between Daniel Moretti and Chaplin uh, in terms of their family histories. Chaplin was raised by his mother. Uh, his father was not a nice man. Um, Unfortunately for Chaplin and his brother Sidney, occasionally their mother had mental health issues and had to be hospitalized. During those periods, they would have to live with their father, and so those were not good times. Um, Moretti had a similar kind of a situation with his home life. And in the case of Lon Chaney, uh, Chaney's parents were deaf mutes, and Chaney was born to them, able to speak and hear. And he became their eyes and ears in the community. They would, he would go out during the day and come home at night and tell them what was going on because he was able to communicate with them through pantomime, which is what led to his 
career as a silent actor. He had developed these amazing skills of expression without using his voice, being able to communicate emotions. Um, and uh, again, the idea of uh, his being the ears and, and, and the mouth that helps communicate from the family. Moretti's father and mother never learned English while he was a child, and he became that for them. So they had some similarities, and, and uh, that's one of the reasons that I, I brought them into this. So okay. um, um, I have, well, I'm working on a couple of different things. One of them is the, the book that's a collection of the sketches that I've been doing. Um, I, many years ago, I started writing um, these, these well, I called them essays at the time, but um, my, I had gone to my 10-year high school reunion, and, and you know, something had happened in my life that was pretty traumatic, which was my mother was murdered. And um, right before our reunion, there was a, uh, a, 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 it came back into the news again. And so I was like going to my reunion thinking, oh my God, I'm going to spend the whole night having people ask me questions about this. And that was kind of disconcerting. But nobody did, which was great. Until Duncan Kennedy walked up to me and said, when I heard about what happened to your mother, and I just kind of like, you know, got ready. And he said, I remember when she was our den mother in Cub Scouts. And I stopped and went, she was our den mother? And I realized I had forgotten that. And you know, one of the things that happens when you experience trauma is your, your mind suppresses things to try and help protect you. And I thought, you know, what's happening is it's protecting me by suppressing not just the things that are negative, but some of the good stuff is going too. I need to start writing these things down. So I began writing these, these essays, which I now call sketches, because all I'm doing is just writing really short descriptions of something that happened that's a memory which might get lost. So I did a batch of those, and then many years later started doing some um, stuff on Facebook. And, and as I started publishing those, my friends started commenting on them and liking them and encouraging me to write more, and I did. I wrote more and more and more and got to the point where they started saying, you should publish these as a book. And so that's the next book. It's called Throwback Thursdays, a sketchbook. And it's going to be those stories combined with some additional ones that I'm going to use to kind of provide bridges between stories and extend other stories. That's one. And then I have another book that's going to follow uh, Persistence of Vision as a sequel um, with the main character and some of the other characters, um, which was suggested to me by a colleague while I was working on the early drafts of the first book. He uh, and I were commuting together in the mornings, and I came out to the car one morning, and he her every morning I'd be writing and get in the car and tell him about what I was working on. I got in the car one morning, and there was a bunch of paper on the seat, and I picked it up, and it's a magazine article that he'd Xeroxed. I said, what's this? And he said, that's your next book. I said, well, okay, and I, I look at this thing, and it's something called the Bonus March. I'd never heard of the Bonus March, and so I read this thing, and apparently this is, you know, now I hear about it more often, but uh, the incident was in 1932, the veterans of World War I who had in their contracts with the U.S. government uh, that they would receive a bonus at some point in the future, which I believe is like 33, 34, but the Depression hit. And by 32, people were really hurting. And so uh, they petitioned the government to pay the bonus early. And Congress voted on it, and they voted against that. And President Hoover at the time, um, he, he said, no, no, we're not going to do that. So they marched on Washington. The veterans of World War I marched on Washington and built a tent city adjacent to Washington, D.C. Well, the tent city was dubbed Hooverville, as all subsequent tent cities were. And Hoover was not pleased by that. So he ordered the military to tear it down, burn it, and get these people out of town. These people having been veterans who were with their families, and their, I mean their wives and their children in this tent city. So Douglas MacArthur, who they fought with in World War I, brought in tanks and soldiers and they were routed, and the tent city was burned to the ground. And when I heard this, I thought, this is horrible. This, I, and never having heard of this episode in history, and I, you know, I, I studied history in school, this wasn't something they talked about. So I decided, yeah, you know what? 
That's the backstory of my next book. He's going to go back there because my main character is a veteran of World War I, and, and it made sense that he would go back there to support his fellows uh, in that effort. And so I decided something's going to happen that's going to set this in motion. And so I'm five chapters into that right now. And it's happening kind of the way the first book did. As I write it, it's writing itself. That's, that's how I know when I'm on the right track, is when things just start clicking. So that's, that's what I'm working on now. Well, I, you know, self-publishing was not something so much I wanted to do as, you know, it was go through the trials of finding a publisher or an agent to represent you. Um, after we, we had done this, these interviews with literary agents, I realized that it almost didn't matter. Uh, what we were hearing from these people was, oh, self-publishing poo-poo, but that all the publishing companies were shifting the responsibility of promotion onto the authors, which means you need to have this, they call it platform, right? How much are you willing to do to support the promotion of your book? And I thought, well, so basically, if I do it on my own, I'm going to be showing them that. So I decided, okay, I got a website. I started a Facebook page for, for my first book. I now have a second Facebook page for the second book. Um, I began posting articles that I found that were related to the subject. I do these Google um, alerts. So every day I get a list of articles that appear on the internet about things related to my book. So Laurel and Hardy. John Barrymore, Lon Chaney, the Golden Age of Hollywood, Palm Springs, historic, Los Angeles, historic. You know, it's, it's so the 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 stories that are coming in, I'm then sharing as a way to try and keep my my page visible to the people that follow it. Um, so it, it's not like I recommend necessarily to people that they self-publish, but um, it's so easy to do now. Um, that, you know, I mean, I won't say anybody can do it, but anybody can do it. Well, it took me a long time to write this book. It took me 25 years. And I have to say, um, anybody that wants to do something creative, don't let anybody talk you out of it. Um, and I, I said this before, especially if that person is yourself. Because I did the best thing I've ever done in my life. It just took me a long time to do it. And it, my life has changed as a result.